Hello y'all. This is, again, the Negative Maps YouTube channel. Today we're going to be reading our friend Jack's essay on Deleuze's book, Bergsonism. It's a series of essays yet to be released as we engage with the text in detail, and you can check out our readings on our page. But what Jack has been doing is reading Bergsonism and writing essays on each chapter, and so far we've got the first chapter, and then with each chapter, Jack is going to keep writing more. What's really important to kind of get over with at the start of it is, like, why are we talking about Bergson? Um, who, who was this Bergson guy? So for us, we encountered Henry Bergson through the philosophy of Gil Deleuze and Felix Guattari. This is actually more of Deleuze's early history philosophy work prior to the Immaculate Conception, which is Deleuze and Guattari, way before the political project, the anti-psychoanalytic project, or the, I guess, critical of psychoanalysis project, is all of Deleuze's books on the history of philosophy, such as the one on Nietzsche, there's one on Spinoza that's amazing. Um, we're talking about Bergsonism, but there's more. Um, Leibniz as well, and Kant. So you have a bunch of minor as well as major thinkers that Deleuze was really interested in um, as a as Deleuze the philosophy professor but he was a very unordinary philosophy professor in that respect as well because he was really interested in the minor and by that I mean the not major philosophers he was interested in uncovering a kind of alternate path through the history of philosophy that is not usually trekked so this is in our kind of namesake of the project, Negative Maps, I would say that he kind of carves a negative map through the history of philosophy to arrive at his own kind of unique project. We're making rhizomes out here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and rhizome is actually a great way to almost introduce it. Uh, you know, Deleuze, philosophy, philosophy is concept creation. Um, we're trying to develop a metaphysics on par with contemporary math and science where the concept of multiplicity replaces that of substance, event replaces essence, and virtuality or virtual reality replaces possibility. Well, uh, Berks, Bergson is all about that virtuality business. Um, but ultimately, Deleuze is building a philosophy of eminence, which we find in our lovely Spinoza, getting into our Nietzsche in philosophy. Um, and it's with... Nietzsche, De, uh, Bergson, and Maimon, that Deleuze really needs those three specifically uh, because we're trying to invert, invert Kantianism by bringing critique to bear, not simply on false claims to knowledge, morality, but on truth itself through a genealogy and will to power. But <clears throat> from Maimon's reading of Kant, we know Deleuze needs to substitute the notion of the condition of the genesis of the real for the notion of conditions of possibility of representational knowledge. Now, this is where the idea of virtuality and virtualness is going to become key. And again, virtual, virtuality, rhizome, multiplicity, <laughs> Deleuze neologisms. Uh, and Deleuze does, does like those uh, sometimes, but we'll try to, I guess, get into, yeah, bring some clarity to those. I think when you're speaking of Deleuze's neo neologisms, it's important to think of how Deleuze is a thief. He steals concepts. He takes concepts from one discipline, from one area, and then uses them for his own purpose. Um, there's the kind of famous saying of, uh, there is no need to fear or hope, but only to look for new weapons. And that's from... Nice societies of control and i think that that's kind of the method of Deleuzean kind of ethics or praxis that we kind of subscribe to um it's one that is interested in picking up concepts wherever they might interest us and to follow those paths see what connections they leave way to and what kind of a creative project that we can make which is why bergson is so important his creative evolution is a text that is against mechanism, which is to say uh, 
fixed identities in succession over space, which doesn't really yes. leave room for a real creative change, right? Um, we're, we're looking for the real genesis of experience that allows for a novel creation. And that is primarily the work of Bergson in general, but we, I think we're going to also see how that is even possible within Bergsonism itself. So I think that's a good transition to kind of move Been forward. So. Do you want to, do you have any more kind of thoughts? Nah, that's perfect. The reading? Cool. Perfect. Dope. So I'll get right into it. Uh, so this is a part two, uh, but it's, it's, it's a really clear uh, kind of project towards summarizing the part one that I got into, but also summarizing the entire chapter one of Bergsonism. Um, in chapter one, we find Bergson's method of intuition comes in three acts or three to five rules with complementary rules. Uh, problematizing or a critique of false problems, non-existent or badly stated, and the creative invention of a genuine statement that in it will contain a proper solution. Differentiating or conducting a search for genuine differences in kind through a carving out of intersections between converging and diverging series. And finally, temporalizing or an apprehension of real time by thinking in terms of duration. In fact, intuition as a method presupposes duration through a type of precision unlocked through a broadening effort on our limited thinking of space and time in terms of extensity as well as intensity. Chapter two of Bergsonism gets further into how intuition presupposes duration and how it also gives duration a new extension from that point of view of being and knowledge. The, so let's jump right into the first rule of Bergsonism's intuition as method. It states, apply the test of true and false problems true and false to problems themselves condemn false problems and reconcile truth and creation at the level of problems we must first state the problem and in doing so we engage in a creative process of invention not discovery though in this first stage and this creative invention gives being to something that previously did not exist in metaphysics, the effort of invention consists most often in raising the problem or in creating the terms in which it will be stated. But this has a double-fold nature in that the formulation of the statement of the problem has a close equivalency of the solving of the problem. The truly great problems are set forth only when they are solved. We must be careful here not to define the truth or falsity of a problem by its possibility or impossibility of it being solved though. We wish to get an intrinsic determination of falsity in the expression of the problem. And this is where we get our uh, complementary rule to the first rule. False problems are of two sorts. Non-existent problems, defined as problems whose very terms contain a confusion of the more and less and badly stated questions such defined because their terms represent badly analyzed composites. We wish to actualize the virtual, not realize the possible. And by doing so, we sidestep the issue of non-existent problems altogether. Non-existent problems contain confusion with the more and less in a few different ways. And Bergson is famous for this analysis here. There is not less but more in the idea of non-being than that of being in disorder than in order, and in the possible than in the real. In the idea of non-being, there is the idea of being, plus a generalized negation in the form of a logical operation, plus the particular psychological motive for that operation. That is, three different things in the idea of non-being, on top of the idea, idea of being as well. Therefore, non-being must be more than being, if we keep our analysis as simple as possible here. There's a curious mental operation to note. When a being does not correspond to our expectation, and we grasp it purely as lack, the lack is the novelty, in that it points to an absence 
and that which interests us. For the possible is only the real, with the addition of an act of mind that throws its image back into the past, once it has been enacted. The subjective aim or motive of that act of mind we do is a type of confusion, where we retroactively perform in which we confuse some upsurge of reality in the universe with a succession of states and a closed system. In this retroactive confusion, though, an act of an act of the mind, we fall into an error in which we mistake the more for the less. In this, we behave as if non-being existed before being or the possible before existence, as if being itself had come to fill in a void or the real to realize a primary possibility. Being or the existent are truth itself. But when we get confused with false problems, we find ourselves in the presence of a fundamental illusion, a retrograde movement of the true. According to which, being and the existent are supposed to precede themselves somehow, or to precede the very creative act that constitutes them by projecting an image of themselves back into a possibility, or a non-being which are supposed to be primordial. There's a curious tangent to be had here with the board and myths, with the society of the society of the spectacle where i believe some bergson influence found its way down that path maybe in the future we can explore something like that but this non-existent problem that we illustrated is the confusion with the more for the less but bergson also speaks of a similar confusion with the less for the more this is doubt about an action that only adds to the action and indicates a half-willing or a non-fully actualized desire. In this, negation is not added to what it denies, but only indicates a weakness in the person who denies. For we feel a divinely created will or thought is too full of itself. In the immensity of its reality, to have the slightest idea of a lack of order or lack of being, to imagine the possibility of absolute disorder, all the more the possibility of nothingness, would be for it to say to itself that it might not have existed at all. And that would be a weakness incompatible with its nature, which is force. It is not something more, but something less. It is a deficit of the will. Bergson equally condemns both of these forms of non-existent problems, confusing the more for the less and confusing the less for the more. The idea of the possible appears when, instead of grasping each existent in its novelty, the whole of existence is related to a preformed element from which everything is supposed to emerge by simple realization. By thinking in terms of more or less and confusing them, we are disregarding differences in kind between the two orders, beings or existence. In this way, we stumble upon a curious double-fold nature in the false problems. The first type of false problem rests in the final analysis of the second. The idea of possibility emerges from a general idea of the real or existent and disorder emerges from a general idea of order, both though critically as badly analyzed composites. We must be careful not to disregard differences in kind, conflate that and disregard as well differences in degree, which are differences in intensity, but we'll go on to see intensity is a nasty one, and not to conceive of everything in terms of more and less. These actions would be to engage in a form of the second false problem, that of a badly stated problem. Badly stated problems have deep in them a sinister mechanism, that of badly analyzed composites, using this to arbitrarily group things that differ in kind. Bergson's famous analysis here again is that he condemns intensity, intensity that is, as a badly analyzed composite. In our perception of intensities on the plane of eminence is a sensation that we confuse with the muscular space that corresponds to it, or we confuse it with the quantity of the physical cause that produced it. It is in this way that the notion of intensity involves an impure mixture between determinations that differ in kind. Bergson also uses this same notion when speaking about freedom. For him, freedom is pure mobility. So the problem of freedom is where two types of multiplicity are confused. 
such as terms juxtaposed in space and states that merge together in duration. Through freedom and its pure mobility, though, we can watch out for a kind of illusion that appears, that of illusory images of motionless or blocking staticness, where we get a kind of illusion or mirage. Mirage. The Kantian mirage is what Bergson is invoking here, a projection backwards of the possible by an inevitable illusion of reason, of which only the effects can be warded off. This illusion is based in the deepest part of our intelligence and can only be repressed. We can react against this intellectual tendency by bringing to life another tendency, that of the intuition as method. In intuition, we can rediscover differences in kind, that is metaphysical, non-measurable, that of spirit, beneath differences in degree, that of scientific, measurable matter. Differences in kind are which that needs a precise metaphysical language of Ilan Vital, where intensity and its problems, as well as duration and its heterogeneous multiplicity, qualitative, whereas differences in degree, or that where a precise scientific language of matter, in which extensity or space is the plane, and has a homogeneous or quantitative multiplicity. Bergson says the intellect, or that which is good at creating differences in degree is the faculty that states problems in general but we need to use our intuition or that which is good at discovering differences in kind to take the stated problem from this intellect further by using intuition for its decision between a kind of true and false this can be a struggle and we should drive our intellect back with our intuition so that's a, so uh, you, you see here the uh the delineation between intuition and intellect, but again, the differences in kind and differences in degree and how important these become. Right. And I think the, just to kind of give some clarification on this extensity intensity kind of dualism, it's quite simple, but the words can be kind of difficult to wrap your hand around at first. So extensity is that which takes up space, which is, again, like something like matter, it is physical, it takes up space. We're not saying that it takes up time, we're saying it takes up space, right? And intensity is that which is internal or intensive. So it's internal to a certain body. Whenever Deleuze uses the word intensity, it's to mean basically the the whole of one, which is, you could say, the whole of the universe or everything that makes up life is one, which is made up of a multiplicity of different kinds of composites. So that's where the kind of term or the the saying plur pluralism equals monism comes from. It's a deeply Spinoza's concept, which basically refers to what Spinoza said is that there's um, basically two multiplicities, and Bergson says this too, so I'm being a little bit coy. Um, there are thought and extension. So thought is very intensive, or um, you could say it's immaterial, and then um, extension is material. So we're, we're seeing a very clear collapsing of the binary between, um, you could say body and mind, you could also say it's a collapsing of between like the um, material and idealism, right? So we're, and we're not even necessarily saying that the, that there is kind of a primacy of one over the other. The exact point is that they're both, if you don't see them as things that differ in kind, you're missing the point. And that, that's kind of the task of Bergsonism is to kind of bring these two composites, which are an impure mixture and through a sort of, um, shaking of gold through this the silt or the so like the, the the gold miners right they were there or the the gold rush people in colorado they would go through the river and sift gold right that is the exact kind of concept of your you, they're sorting between what is um intensity and extensity or is sorting between the two types of composites and it's we're not even saying that there should be a pure 
of anything because it's always going to be slightly impure. But the point is to how we can narrow or even widen our gaze so we can start to see where there are differences in kind and not just differences in degree. So from one that is qualitative, which is differences in kind, versus quantitative, which is differences in degree. And the goal is to not mix those up. And yeah, that's kind of, that's the main thing there. That's, that's really good. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, it's always valuable to say uh, a million times maybe that uh, it's the artist that creates affects, the scientist that creates, what was it, precepts? Yeah, percepts. <laughs> and the philosopher that creates per percepts and the philosopher that creates concepts. Um, <laughs> and intensity is full of affect, extensity is full of space, matter, you could call it, you know. Um, and let's see, oh, and I, so a uh, fun thing, another fun thing with Deleuze Deleuze says the history of philosophy isn't a collection of grand narratives, but a collection of created unique concepts or historical artifacts, kind of new ways of thinking. It's, a, it's always fun to dive into history with, with that, uh, that little strategy. But uh, yeah, second rule, differentiating kind with Deleuzean calculus. Second rule, struggle against the illusion rediscover the true differences in kind or articulations of the real. Bergson loves his dualisms, for he has a method of intuition to skewer them on the spot. According to him, a composite must always be divided according to its natural articulations of the real, that is, into elements that differ in kind. Intuition as method is one of division, that of platonic inspiration. The goal when articulating the real is to not mix extensity and duration so much that it becomes problematic to the point of non-usefulness. In the same way, we mix recollection with perception and don't know how to recognize what goes back to recollection or what goes back to perception. In this example, we no longer distinguish between the two, the two pure presences of matter and memory and representation and no longer see any differences in degree between perception recollections and recollection perceptions we are measuring the impure mixture with a unit itself that is faulty and have lost the ground of composites and which lands us firmly in badly analyzed composite land for bergson pure has a very specific meaning in that it refers to a restoration of differences in kind and it is only tendencies that differ in kind. Now, that's a really, really good thing to remember that pure has a specific meaning, it refers to restoration of differences in kind, and it's a kind of tendency, you know. Composites, therefore, need to be divided using intuition according to qualitative and qualified tendencies, depending on duration and extensity as they are defined as movements and directions of movements. Deleuze calls this the Bergsonian le motif. People have seen differences in degree where there are differences in kind. And Bergson's fundamental criticism of metaphysics is that it sees differences in degree between a spatialized time and an eternity, which it assumes to be primary. All beings here are defined on a scale of intensity between the two extremes of perfection and nothingness. But a similar criticism is directed at science as well as there is no definition of mechanism other than that which invokes a spatialized time in which beings no longer present anything but differences of degree, of position, dimension, proportion. The source of false problems that are all around us and the illusions that overwhelm us lies in this disregard for true differences in kind. Bergson shows how the forgetting of differences in kind on one hand between perception and affection and on the other hand between perception and recollection gives rise to all kinds of false problems by making us think that our perception is inextensive in character. There are in the ideas that we project outside ourselves states which are purely internal. So many misconceptions, so many lame answers to badly stated questions. <clears throat> in Matter and Memory, Bergson shows us how complex the manipulation of intuition is as a method of division. Here, the representation has to be divided into the elements that condition it. 
It's either pure presences or tendencies of different kind. Bergson first asks between what two things there may be or may not be a difference in kind. The response here to this is that since the brain is an image, that is, in the presence of many other images, and the brain and the brain ensures certain movements among other movements, there cannot be a difference in kind between the faculty of the brain, which is said to be perceptive, and the reflex and the reflex function of the core. The body to Bergson is a distinct kind of kind of image in that we do not know it only from without by perceptions, but also from within by affections. If we take the conditions in which the affections from within the body are produced, we find that they always interpose themselves between the excitations received from without, as well as the movement from which is about to be executed, as though the affections had some undefined influence on the final result. If we pass each affection in in a kind of meditative review, we find that each contains in it a kind of invitation to act, and yet can be left to wait and even to not act upon at all. Oh, there was a really interesting, there's really, really good Tibetan Buddhist kind of ideas there. Um, if we peer even deeper into the affections of the body from within, we see that we find movements begun, but not executed the indication of a more or less useful decision, but not that constraint which precludes choice. If we think of the habits of the organic world, we see the same sensibility appear, where nature confers upon the living being a power of mobility and space, but gives as a warning to the species by means of sensation of the general dangers which threaten it. But this threat is left to the organic individual receiving the perceptive sensation, necessary precautions for escaping whatever is causing the perceptive disturbance. If we remain in this train of thought, Bergson performs an interrogation of consciousness here as to the part in which it plays in the affection of the body. In response, consciousness replies that it is present indeed, but in the form of feeling or of sensation at all steps in which there is a belief of a taking of initiative or subjective aim. This, however, fades, curiously, and disappears as soon as the activity, by becoming automatic, shows that consciousness is no longer necessary. Therefore, we must conclude that the act in which the effective state issues is not one of those which might be rigorously deduced from antecedent phenomena as a movement from a movement. And hence it really adds something new to the universe and to its history. All seems to take place as if in this aggregate of images, which I call the universe, nothing really new could happen except through the medium of certain particular images, the type of which is furnished to me by my body. How interesting. The body. What can the body do? The body perceives afferent nerves, which transmit a disturbance to the nerve centers, central nervous system where brain is semi-conscious for complex decisions and the spine is unconscious for simple decisions. And then efferent nerves, which start from the nerve centers, then communicate the disturbance to the periphery, the sensations like position awareness and balance, where motion is set in parts of the body or the body as a whole. Bergson questions the physiologists and the psychologists as to the purpose of both kinds, and they respond that centrifugal movements that have a tendency to move away from the center of the nervous system can call forth of movement of the body or of parts of the body. This is so the centripetal force, a tendency to move towards the center, or at least some of them give birth to the representation of the external world, representation of the external world. The afferent nerves are images like the brain. The disturbance that travels through the sensory nerves and propagates in the brain is an image as well. Here, 
we are in the presence of at least three images, the nerves, the brain, and the disturbance itself. But if the image representation that we are calling the, disturb the disturbance somehow came before the external, external images, it would contain them in one way or another. And the representation, representation of the whole material universe would be implied in that of this movement. The image that is the disturbance then cannot come before the external image. And this can be further proven through a thought experiment. If we eliminate the image that we call the universe, and at the same time, you destroy the image that we call the brain. So when we destroy the, the image that is the universe, at the same time, we find that we would destroy the image that we call the brain, as well as the cerebral disturbance that we call the image. Both that are both images of the universe. That's the, the key factor there. You take away the universe, you lose it all. However, if we were to eliminate the two latter images that we call the brain and the disturbance, then the brain and the disturbance vanish, but the universe remains untouched. So <laughs> you remove those two in the universe, so we still have something. That is to say, to make of the brain the condition on which the whole image depends is in truth a contradiction in terms, since the brain is by hypothesis a part of this image. This shows that neither nerves nor nerve centers can condition the image of the universe. External images influence the image that I call my body by transmitting movement to it. This body can also influence external images by giving back movement to them. My body is in the aggregate of the material world, an image which acts like other images, receiving and giving back movement with one difference only that my body appears to choose within certain limits the manner in which it shall restore what it receives. The body is a center of action. It receives and returns movement. Does the body in general and the nervous system in particular come before the whole or part of the representation of the universe? We could say that my body is matter or that is an image. If matter is part of the material world and the material world exists around it and without it as previously shown if it however is an image that image can give but what has been put into it and since it is by hypothesis the image of my body only then it would be absurd to expect to get from it that of the whole universe my body an object destined to move other objects is then a center of action it cannot give birth to a representation we find that our body is a privileged image, providing for the exercise of choice among other possible reactions. As a rule, any image influences other images in a manner which is determined, even calculable, through what we are called what, that what we call laws of nature. There is no choosing there, though, so neither has it any need to explore the region about it nor to try its hand at several merely eventual actions. That's not the game of the laws of nature. The necessary action will take place automatically when required. Bergson supposes that the image of the body is to exercise on other images a real influence, and consequently to decide which step to take among several which are all materially possible. And this is the eternal possibilities of Whitehead, in essence. Whitehead, a student of Bergson. These steps are probably suggested to it by the greater or less advantage which the body can derive from the surrounding image it is in presence with. These images must display in some way upon the aspect which they present to my body, either the joyful passion or sad passion that my body can gain. Here... My body can note the size, shape, and color of the external object and their modifications depending on my moving towards or moving away from them. The intensity or magnitude increases or decreases with distance. This distance then represents the measure in which surrounding bodies are insured in some sort against the immediate action of my body. That is to say, the degree in which I can widen my horizon the images which surround me 
seem to be painted upon a more uniform background and become indifferent to me. However, the more I can narrow this horizon, the more the objects which it circums circumscribes space themselves out distinctly according to the great, greater or less ease, less ease with which my body can touch and move them. Like a mirror, they send back then to my body its eventual influence and tank rank in an order corresponding to the growing or decreasing power of my body. You know, again, you know, this is not even Spinoza yet. You know, we have positive joy, you know, positive, uh, happy passions, sad passions, joy, all through Bergson. This is where Deleuze, again, Deleuze and Bergson just go hand in hand. I think it's the the capacity to affect and to be affected. And this is kind of, I think, what you're observing with, um, through Bergson and Deleuze, this idea of images, um, that the, the brain as image is not external to the material world. It is a part of it. So I think that the problem of like the more and the less to kind of bring it back, right? So to think that like, um, our brain could perceive the external world and make concepts about it prior to the existence of the world, which is a contradiction in terms, as you said. So you, there, there needs to already be the external material world in order to have any kind of genesis of the real. And part of, but the brain still has an important part. The, the mind and the body still have an important part in how it is something that affects the material world and is affected by it. So at the same time that the the brain interprets the world, it is also changing it simultaneously through the body as intuition, through through intuition as method. Absolutely. Um, and let's try to remember. Uh, let's get back to the yeah. What was the, the second rule in a sense? So it was if we modify, I think. We, yeah, rediscover the true differences in kind. So again, and how to mm -hmm. rediscover true differences in kind? Oof. Discovery, creation, discovery is going to be an act of uh, intuition. Typically, again, the stating of the problem is what the intellect is good at, but mm -hmm. intuition is going to kind of try to discover differences in kind, but by doing so, uh, a kind of truth or falsity, but that actually doesn't answer it. Uh, we'll find that some further chapter is that instinct is what finally answers it. But oh, what I talked about in part one as well was, uh, and kind of here again, though, the, the answer really comes with the stating of the problem. So I don't even know really the, the part instinct plays in that, but here we're really finding intuition is the, uh, to me, almost uh, an act of body and intellect an act of the mind. So we're trying to find what, 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 what can we do to, you know, struggle against the intellect? Well, we can, see what a body can do and uh that really comes at exactly what the hell is the body dealing with yeah well, and that's the, where yeah the mind's always a part of the body and the spine is what kind of controls those unconscious movements right so the nervous when we talk about the nervous system as a system I think it's important not to kind of give primacy to one over the other the body or the mind um which I think is very important for understanding Bergson in general, as well as Deleuze. Absolutely. Um, and <clears throat> throughout this, I tried to litter Eastern stuff like mirror talk and again, beads of thoughts. Uh, that's just stuff that we'll, I'll try to explore more with uh, a little, a little Deleuze help, but uh, yeah. I'm ready to jump back in if you, if you are. The objects which surround my body, reflect its possible actions upon them. If we modify this image, which we call the body slightly by deleting the afferent nerves of the cerebrospinal system, what would happen? The rest of the universe is still intact as if the rest of my body all remains as before. The change that has occurred is that actually my perception has vanished. Centripetal nerves or those that deliver messages inward from outside afferent nerves, whereas centrifugal, ner centrifugal nerves deliver the message outward from inside or send back movement to the periphery. periphery. Centripetal nerves or afferent nerves, therefore, produce an 
effect, that is to interrupt the current or flow which goes from periphery to periphery by way of the sensor, though. So if we analyze this modification of an image of body that has no afferent nerves, it would make it impossible for the body to extract from among all the things which surround it the quantity and quality of movement necessary in order to act. That is something which concerns concerns action and action alone, yet it is perception that has vanished. You know, that's how, how curious. My perception must, in the midst of the image world, display an outward reflection or shadow to the eventual or possibility of actions for my body. This curious thought experiment of a vanish, vanishing of perception in the image of the body shows that for the material world, the removal of the afferent nerves did little. But for the body that the afferent nerves vanished, so does the perception of matter. I call matter the aggregate of images, Bergson says, and perception of matter, the same images, referred to the eventual action of one particular image, my body. The brain is concerned with motor reaction, not with conscious perception, but the brain itself, an image, cannot create images. It does not manufacture representations but only complicates the relation between a received movement, that is excitation, and an executed movement, our response. Between excitation and response, the brain establishes an interval. Whether it divides up the received movement infinitely or prolongs it in a plurality of possible reactions. Even if recollections take advantage of this interval, or strictly speaking, interpolate themselves, nothing changes. By virtue of this cerebral interval, in effect, a being can retain from a material object and the actions issuing from it only these elements that interest him. This is so that the perception is not the object plus something, but the object minus something, minus everything that does not interest it. This is to say that the object itself merges with a kind of pure virtual perception. But at the same time, as our real perception merges with the object from which it has abstracted only that which does not interest us. We perceive things where they are. Perception puts us at once into matter is impersonal and coincides with the perceived object. Continuing on this same line, the whole of Bergson's method consists, first of all, in the seeking the terms between which there could not be a difference in kind. There could not be a difference in kind, but only a difference in degree. Between the faculty of the brain and the function of the core, between the perception of matter and matter itself. Fictions for Deleuze allow us to assume that the body is like a pure mathematical point in space, a pure instant, or a succession of instants in time. But these fictions were not simply hypotheses, but consist in pushing beyond experience, a direction drawn from experience itself. This is how we can extract a whole aspect of the conditions of experience and then be left with the missing component left to answer, that of what fills up the cerebral interval, what takes advantage of it to become embodied. To this end, Bergson has a threefold response. Firstly, affectivity, which assumes that the body is something other than a mathematical point, which gives it volume and space. Next, recollections of memory, that link the instance of fiction to each other and interpolate the past into the present. And finally, memory, but again in another form, in the form of a contraction of matter. That's what makes the quality appear. Memory is what makes the body something other than the instantaneous and gives it a duration in time representation in general is divided in two directions that differ in kind 
two pure presences that do not allow themselves to be represented. That of perception, which puts us at once into matter, and that of memory, which puts us at once into the mind. All of our false problems derive from the fact that we do not know how to go beyond experience toward the conditions of experience, toward the articulations of the real, and rediscover what differs in kind in the composites that are given to us and on which we live. These two acts, perception and recollection, always interpenetrate each other, are always exchanging something of their substance as, a pro as by a process of endosmosis. The proper office of psychologists would be to dissociate them, to give back to each its natural purity. In this way, many difficulties raised by psychology and perhaps also by metaphysics might be lessened. But they will have it that these mixed states compounded in unequal proportions of pure perception and pure recollection are simple. And so we are condemned to an ignorance alike of pure recollection and of pure perception, to knowing only a single kind of phenomenon that will now be called <laughs> that will be called now recollection and now perception, according to the predominance in a, in it of one or other of the two aspects. And consequently, the finding between perception and recollection only a difference in degree and not in kind. Intuition leads us to go beyond the state of experience, toward the conditions of experience. These conditions, however, are not general nor abstract and are no broader than conditioned. They are the conditions of real experience. Bergson speaks of going to seek experience at its source, or rather, above that decisive turn, where, taking a bias in the direction of our utility, it becomes properly human experience. It is above this turn that we find the point at which we can finally discover differences in kind. There are many difficulties in trying to gain access to this focal point, and as a result, the actions of intuition have to be multiplied. A movement of intuition is always properly situated to the experience and utilizes a double-fold nature to either move to broaden its horizon or narrow it and tighten it in its ends. And this way we are pushed beyond our own experience through an extraordinary broadening out that forces us to think of a pure perception identical to the whole of matter, a pure memory identical to the totality of the past. Bergson compares philosophy to the procedure of infinite small, infinite small calculus. When we gain a little insight from a certain experiential line of articulation, all that remains is to extend it beyond experience. Just as mathematicians reconstitute through the differentials or infinitely small slopes at each point and a curve can indicate or point to the real curve the curve itself stretching out into the darkness behind them. That's a funny way to say what they're trying to say, though. Again, it's real simple. Derivatives or differentials are just little tiny slopes. It's just telling us the slope of the, the line so that you can project it into the future. That's what he's saying here, how the curve itself stretches out into the darkness behind it. That's kind of, in, in a sense, this is what how math, math, mathematicians kind of constitute that point now this broadening out or even going beyond does not consist in going beyond experience towards concepts for concepts only define in the kantian manner that is a priori the conditions of all possible experience in general on the other hand it is a case of real experience and all of its peculiarities and if we must broaden it or even go beyond it then there is an there is only an order to find the articulations on which these peculiarities depend or are contingent, such that the conditions of experience are less determined by concepts. For Kant, the intellect provides the concepts, either pure or empirical in nature, abstract idea or notion. Then, in pure percepts, object of perception. These percepts themselves are united in a concept. 
but it is a concept molded on the thing itself, which only suits that thing, and which in this sense is no broader than what it must account for. Oh, and here we get our lines of flight. You know, you, uh, Deleuze loves his... Uh, Deleuze loves his lines of flight, and then Whitehead talks about flights of speculation. I always get those confused. They're, they're so s similar. <laughs> These lines of flight, using intuition as method, can be followed beyond the turn in experience. But we must also rediscover the point at which they intersect again, where the directions cross and where the tendencies that differ in kind linked together again to give rise to the thing as we know it. It might be thought that nothing is easier and that experience itself has already given us this point. But it is not as simple as that, according to Deleuze and Bergson. For after we have followed these lines of divergence beyond the turn, these lines must intersect again, not at the point from which we started, but rather at a virtual point at a virtual image of the point of departure, which itself is itself located beyond the turn in experience, and which finally gives us the sufficient reason of the thing, the sufficient reason of the composite, the sufficient reason of the point of departure. In this way, the expression beyond the decisive turn has two meanings twofold meaning. First, it denotes the moment when the lines setting out from an uncertain common point given an experience diverge increasingly according to the differences in kind. Secondly, it denotes another movement. It denotes another moment when these lines converge again to give us this time the virtual image or the distinct reason of the common point. This is why Bergson loves finding dualism in any form with this method of intuition, because in this we can leverage dualism as a moment which must lead to the reformation of a monism. And this way, after the broadening out of the horizon, a final narrowing follows, which, like integration, follows differentiation in calculus. Differentiation, again, gives us slopes of curves, but does so by breaking breaks a hole in, into infinitely small pieces such that we can analyze and be modified. But it is always done so to, such that we can reintegrate these pieces back into the whole again. That is to say, sum up all of these infinitely small pieces in the desired area to return, but this time with something new. We have alluded elsewhere to those lines of fact, each one indicating but the direction of truth, because it does not go far enough. Truth itself, however, will be reached if two of them can be prolonged to the point where they intersect. In our opinion, this method of intersection is the only one that can bring about a decisive advance in metaphysics. There are therefore two successive turns in experience, as it were, both in a reverse direction. They constitute what Bergson calls precision philosophy. This is where we get our complementary rule to the second. And again, we have three rules, two complementaries. This is where we get like a three, five kind of, it's like a three, five rule of intuition as method. So far, before we, until next time, two rules in one complementary rule. Jack, just can you summarize really quickly? And I know you kind of just did this a second ago, but can you um, summarize really quickly the two rules and the complementary rule so far. So what we have to watch for in the first rule is uh, false problems, which break down into, you know, uh, <laughs> that's the funny enough, the complementary rule of the first rule is false problems break down into non-existent problems and badly stated problems. But this, as we see, those two play hand in hand with each other. They're not really, uh, you know, the first leads into the second, but the, you know, the first rule, let's call it, is the problematizing the false problem. Mm -hmm. That's actually setting up the false problem such that we can, you know, kind of get through them. But by doing so, we have to 
analyze what are false problems naturally the complementary rule to that mm -hmm. and then the the second rule we got into so once we've already kind of attempted we, we've successfully stated the problem and figured out you know non-existent or badly stated different kind different type or different degree second rule goes into the next step which is uh, rediscovering true differences in kind or articulations of the real, but this is a real movement almost of, uh, of intuition. Again, the first rule is really the, the, the intellect kind of formulating the problem, but the second rule is the intuition uh, determining the truth or falsity of the decision. Now, like, the, the intuition is not going to answer this problem here, but we're trying to kind of massage the, the problem almost and, again, rediscover true differences isn't kind but in doing so we have to struggle against an illusion and that illusion is again this like mirage that bergson gets out of kant and it's deep in our intellect deep in our intelligence apparently <laughs> but no, that's 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 what we got to um and again the there's another complementary rule to come and then a third rule so uh <laughs> well very dope I think that's a good place to wrap it up for today. And we'll get back to this monster of an epic essay going over breaking down Bergsonism from Deleuze and Guitar, or sorry, from Deleuze, but really through Jack. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Peace. All right, I'm 